So I don't know if, uh, if anyone's excited about this or even knows what it is, but I can tell you, you all should be excited about it because it is actually really neat. It's, it's very limited right now, but uh, I'll start talking about it. Um, so I, I think this all started, I mean, it's a little fuzzy because we've been talking about it for a while, but I really think this all started because we had this question, um, why aren't scripts being shared? There are certainly lots of them out there, great ways to go to GitHub and look for things that are the bro language. And it will find scripts that various people have shared on GitHub. Great. However, how many of you are going out to GitHub every day and like, oh, yes, I d download the script and I copy it out to my sensors and I just run it and like, it's, it's like three steps and three steps, that's not really fun. But there were, there were a couple of things that I, I had in mind why scripts weren't being shared and um, one of, the, one of the reasons, I think, and this is, I don't think we can really do much about, but a lot of people have sort of secret techniques. I certainly know that when I was doing operational security, I kind of felt that way, because I was like, I mean, granted, the community at that point was like non-existent, so I could have posted anything, and the attackers would have never heard about it. Um, but, you know, like secret techniques, or just little tweaks you're doing, or something. Um, there's also organizational momentum against sharing. is a really, really common one. There's just a lot of organizations that have a very hard time sharing stuff. Um, this one I don't know how to fix, honestly. Uh, it's, it's just difficult. Making a script that doesn't work for me. Making something that works for me is, is pretty easy, but making something that works for you and you and you and you is, is extremely difficult. But there's this one, difficulty in discovery and installation. That sounds tractable. Like we can, we can approach that problem. We can solve this one. Let's think about how to do that. Well, that's when Mozilla comes along and thankfully gives us a big pile of money to say, yes, we would like that problem solved. Where's Mikhail? There you are. Thank you for, uh, thank you for sponsoring us in, uh, in Mozilla and pushing for it. Um, I think there's some really good stuff that's going to come from it. Um, so, and I should also say thanks to John Seawick, who was a former core team member who was willing to take on this task. <laughs> and um, he, he took it on through NCSA, and he's been working on it. And I sent him an email this morning complaining about something, and he makes changes all the time for me now. So the reason, though, that I got put doing the presentation is that I'm the first one to play with it. So yay me. <laughs> um, so what's the idea then? It's great to say, oh, well, we should have a package manager. But then immediately the question is, well, what is, what is that really? And it, everyone's familiar with the scripting languages that have it. I didn't put Perl CPAN. I didn't even think about that. That's sort of the granddaddy of them all. Um, so you have CPAN, PIP, Ruby Gems, all sort of same thing. It's this whole discovery and installation issue that they take care of. It's very hard. Can, you, can anyone imagine if Python did not have PIP and you're just like, go to GitHub and grab it. And then it's like it has like 15 dependencies, and you're like, go download those ones too and put them in. It would be just completely horrible. Um, it, it, the one really nice thing it has, and, and I've certainly like been um, affected by this for years, is it connects author, uh, script authors and users. Like I, some of my scripts, like I've got some kind of neat things, I think, that aren't actually in Bro. And, um, it, not everyone runs them because they don't know about it or it's just sort of that, well, I didn't do it today because it was like three steps. So, you know, it's just kind of a uh, uh, momentum of not doing it. Um, and, and also we really wanted to foster an ecosystem of sharing scripts and just making sort of, uh, you know, rising all boats by more people writing scripts because suddenly there's motivation because now you can get users to use your scripts and hopefully, those users complain about things. Complaining is a good thing. Don't think it's a bad thing. It's a good thing. You should have people complain because your stuff inevitably does not work for everyone. And then the ultimate real reason anyone would do that is that you make life harder on attackers. Suddenly your logs have more attacker tells in them. Like, oh, you know, uh, I, I, I don't know. One, one example could be, um, you yeah. know, Geez, I don't know, just even something really tiny and, and somewhat arbitrary, like a regular expression that gets run on certificate subjects. 
I can imagine someone literally creating a package like that. It seems kind of like intelligence data, but the intelligence stuff doesn't support regular expressions right now. But if someone literally is like, just install this thing and run it, go. And if it's that easy, then suddenly maybe that's a worthwhile package actually to distribute. Um, so I think Matthias actually came up with the first design proposal for this, right? Yeah, so uh, I, I've been the least involved in this project, I think, of everybody. Um, but it, Matthias had come up with sort of a design proposal originally, and multiple people ended up commenting on it. And if anyone does want to participate in design stuff, join the Bro Dev list. We really try to push things there now. We've been historically been bad about it, but we're trying to get better. And um, the design proposals, design and architecture proposals, all get put on the Bro.org website. I, what's the area on the website? It's like, it's yeah, it's under development, and there's sort of like uh, projects or something like that. But we put actual design proposals and stuff up there because none of us are smart enough to just make things. Um, so the design of it is that it's really just a Python library with a command line front end. So it's going to be very familiar to anyone that has used CPAN or GEMS or, or PIP. Um, it's just a command line thing you run. There is a centralized package repository, but as a user, you can point to another package repository that you run or that someone else runs, and you can actually, that will be included. So similar to like um, uh, Yum or something where you can add third-party package repositories, that's a, a notion in the Bro Package Manager. Um, one goal that we have, we went through, we went back and forth on this a lot, so if you go back and look at, actually, I don't think previous design proposals are up, so um, we, we had gone back and forth through this because we were like, we wanted to say, let's have it um, sort of like a moderated package list so that we've got people that are like making sure this stuff going in there is sane and whatever. And it, it really turned out that that's probably not good for the community. It's probably better for the community to say there's very, very low friction towards doing a comp, uh, contribution. So anyone in this room, the idea, and it's going to take us a little while to get there so that it's a little better, but anyone inside in this room should be able to, pa pa if I can talk right, publish a package by this afternoon and it would be up and available for people. I mean, that's, that's the real goal. It should be very low friction to being able to, uh, to contribute. It's also, uh, apparently I did packages instead of packaged. It's not packaged with Bro, therefore not tied to Bro's release schedule. Um, there was actually a release of it two days ago or three days ago. Um, the .5 release came out. But it, it, was, and it was very, very minor, minor stuff that, came, that went into it. But the idea is that this is really a completely separate component from Bro. It just happens to be the thingy for doing uh, packages with Bro. We thought that was really good because we tend to keep a fairly uh, slow release, uh, slow and deliberate, I'll use that word, slow and deliberate release schedule for Bro. And uh, having the Bro package manager distributed separately really helps us avoid that. Now here's where everyone goes, darn. There is a requirement, 2.5. Um, you, you, could, you could run it on 2.4. Uh, you can run it on the, the 2.5 beta now, and, um, and I'll, I'll show all that in a minute. But it does require 2.5 because of a little change to help do discovery of where Bro is installed. Um, so the installation. For anyone that's watched Trailer Park Boys, it's Bubbles saying, <laughs> pip install bro package. You guys can run this right now. It works. That will install bro package on your system right now. Um, so that, that's it. That's, there you go. <laughs> um, so it's actually a little bit more involved than that. Um, there, there is documentation. I'll, at the end of the presentation, I'll give the link to, to this documentation. But um, if you can't find it, literally just go to Google and type bro package manager. First two or three links for me, at least. Maybe Google is biasing me, but um, the first two or three links will be to stuff related to the Bro Package Manager. I keep, I'm like hoping that some of the people typing that like someone's going to have this running by the end of it, so that I can be like, yay, it really is actually easy enough for Bubbles to do it. Um, so in terms of configuration, and so what I'm going to do is show this, and then if I have time, I'm going to go ahead and. And actually, I am moving. I'm going to go ahead and, and do it on my laptop so everybody can see that, yes, it does actually work, and it doesn't just uh, show up on slides. So what you actually have to do is, after you do pip install bro package, you have to tell it where your bro binary is. So if, you're, if bro's not already in your path, make sure it's in your path. 
Um, and that's because in the bro binary directory for 2.5, there is a, uh, a little tool called bro config, I think. And that tells, it, that tells this thing where all, where all the, um, where bro's installed, basically, and where to look for some things. And then um, one, one slight little issue is that this actually runs, this, this isn't like, it's not integrating necessarily into bro control. It's not necessarily integrating into anything. So you, as a user then, you configure bro package for your user. You probably want to configure it for the instance of bro that you have installed, but you're going to have to do some permission stuff, and, and I'll show you that. So you do make dir to, to make this .bro package directory in your home directory, and then there's this bro package autoconfig. That's what then goes to that bro config thing, and it basically just sets it up so it knows where to drop files and stuff so that bro knows about them. But you create this uh, config directory there. And the important thing is that it's your user account that is getting configured to run um, bro package. If you, t if you end up then, after you run this bro package auto config, if you then type sudo bro package something, it's the root account, and suddenly you don't have it configured for the root account. So you might have permissions trouble. You can actually see what I did here is did, um, I did the pip install, I did bro package install, and SSN exposure is a package I already put up. Um, it, uh, point five, the point 0.5 release now prints this error. It gave a Python stack trace <laughs> before that. But um, it says user does not have right access to these two directories. The way to fix that, give your user right access, access to those directories. If you use like a shared account on the system, you could do sudo u and change that. So everyone changes that user and then runs bro package. So you kind of get the idea that you know, you've got to have permissions set up correctly. And in the documentation, there's actually a note in there that comments more on this, too. Um, and, and that's happening because it's installing Bro into your, uh, your system directories. So loading the scripts is actually really easy, too. It, it's, it's not hard. When you do at load packages, there is a Bro package ends up creating a package directory in your site directory. So it's nice and easy, because all you have to do is say load packages, then whatever you've done in Bro package just gets loaded. So if you're running bro to command line, you just say packages at the end, and all the bro packages you've installed get loaded. Or if you're in bro control, you just add load packages to the end, or to the end of local.bro, and you're done. So just a little bit on how to use it. You can do things like uh, bro package list all, and what that's going to do is list all the packages that are, hopefully this eventually will be a list that just scrolls and scrolls and scrolls and scrolls, and there's millions of things to install. And it can be a mess like all the other package systems. Um, I, guess, I, think I, I think we aspire to it being a mess. That would be the best case scenario if it's a giant mess of scripts. Um, so anyway, you can see I've got a couple installed. Um, and there's, there's one, actually, that I released yesterday, and the, yesterday that's not in there. Um, so list all. If you, do, if you do list without the all, it'll just have the things that are installed locally. So it would have those three, but not the test package. Um, you can do search. So I, in this case, it actually searches uh, keywords. So I've been attaching keywords. So here you do bro package search DLP, and it tells you, hey, there's this credit card exposure one and SSN exposure. And there, there's, there's help on that. So you can see there's a way of doing regular expressions and things in there. So there are some other commands. You can do like remove, and that'll you know, uninstall and remove uh, a package. If you just want to unload it so that you're not loading it, so what you would do is like unload, bro control, deploy. Um, that will actually leave it on your system, but it will make it so it's not being loaded anymore. And so that's, that's one of the sort of interesting things here is that what you're actually doing is you're using bro package. You're not manually editing a script to say, well, I downloaded these packages. So now I want to run that one and that one and that one. You're using bro package to say, you know, unload this one, remove this one, install that one, install that one, install that one. Um, up, you know, upgrade all of them, upgrade that one, thing, things like that. Making packages, and this, uh, this also becomes very important because there are a lot of people I know that have, like, a script <laughs> floating around somewhere and, and probably something that is reusable by others. Um, it's, it's really easy to actually turn that script into a package. And don't feel bad about a script that's five lines long and turning it into a package, because the moment you turn it into a package and get it put in the package system, you've suddenly made it so that you, you can have users of your script by, by posting on Twitter and saying, literally, bro package install blah, 
and they're done. You don't have to say, well, go to the thing and download it and then copy it to your thing, whatever. You're, it's just very, very easy. Um, the only thing you have to do is put a, a description file in, in, your, in a Git repository. Let's go make one. Um, so you create, a, you create a Git repository, which on GitHub is clearly pretty easy. I, this is one that's already kind of complete, so it's a little weird looking. The thing to keep in mind is, um, and this is, this is the package I published yesterday. And actually, I guess I should say, what this package does, it's a script library. So all this package does is it gives you as a uh, bro user or programmer, I never know what word to use there, but a uh, bro programmer, it gives you um, three functions that you can use in a bro script that help you understand the effective TLD of a domain name. So let's say that someone does a lookup for www.google.co.uk. And if you run it through this thing, there's a function that will say co.uk is the effective TLD. If you say what's the domain, it'll say Google. Um, or I guess in this case, it would say google.co.uk. But it, it has the, the same, it's using the Mozilla stuff. <laughs> it actually uses the same Mozilla rules, which uh, Mozilla uses for effective T, uh, Google.co.uk, if we just split on periods and you're like, oh, the second part is the, you know, the part I'm interested in. Well, it's not really in the case of co.uk and like a billion other cases. But this way, you just kind of get to cheat and skip it. The reason I implemented it was I had seen people doing this really inefficiently for a long time. So I tried to write one that actually did it fairly efficiently and you didn't have to think about it. It just works. Anyway, so um, the actual script itself is in the scripts directory. Um, if you load the scripts directory, there is a, a file in it called underscore underscore load underscore underscore dot bro, which is sort of a, a thing in bro that you can let bro load a whole directory. It just automatically does it. But the important part is that bro package dot meta that's at the bottom. And this is all that's in it. And honestly, this, this is like basically all the ones I've created so far, it's the same content. You just plop that in there and you're good. I'm sure this will expand over time as we add more features and things to uh, the package manager, but this is all it is right now. You put that in there, all it's doing, and this is, this is all documented on the website too. Um, all it's doing is giving a version to your package and telling where the scripts are. And if you do an actual um, uh, compiled plugin, uh, there's like an extra thing you put in there to say how to compile it or whatever. But for the most part, um, this is what I expect most people will be doing. And the other stuff is documented, too, so you can refer to that. So the other step that you have to do is go to git, well, yeah, I guess go to uh, github.com slash bro slash packages. Yeah, so you see up at the top the, uh, the name. Go there, um, fork that repository, and create, like you see, I have the Seth Hall directory. Go ahead and you create that directory for yourself and yours. You add... Um, Oh, see, click fork. Uh, you add a file in there. So I have another, uh, another package called um, credit card exposure. So you go in there and you give the URL for credit card exposure and you give some tags. And this has actually changed a little bit. You can provide a description there too. And so there, they, those, have, uh, those now have descriptions for them. And there's also three in there. Um, but yeah, you add that, and then you do a pull request. And eventually, I think we'll have automatic processes that take place at that point that merge your, your changes in automatically, uh, just, just so that no one, we don't want people to get hampered by us. <laughs> we don't want to be between you and publishing packages. Um, so yeah, and it's the, the file name is bro package.index. But if you, if you fork that packages repository, you'll see it very quickly. So you submit a pull request, and I actually did that for, for one of these. And when you get it merged, now if anyone go, runs bro package and types bro package refresh, your package will show up. And they can install it by saying, you know, bro package install your package. Um, there, there are, good, I have lots of time. There are a lot of things that need added to this still. I mean, essentially, all this is right now is it's, get files from the internet, put them on disk in the right place, maybe build a plugin if that needs to be built. And, um, and, and that, that's really it. It, it does provide, a, it's, very, it's pretty nice, but there's clearly a lot of stuff that can be added to it. 
things like dependencies. I mean, eventually things like uh, the domain TLD script might be a dependency of something else that uses it. So you just install that other thing, and then it just installs the uh, domain TLD thing. Can you talk yeah. about what a packet actually is? Oh. It's more than, I only a script. No, I, I, okay. <laughs> See, someone else should have played with it first. Yeah, but uh, so I'll, I'll get back to that stuff. Um, um, they are, so Matthias was asking if I could talk about packages being more than scripts. They are more than scripts. I didn't talk about it because I expect scripts to be the main thing initially. It's documented. So they can be, um, they can be plugins also, and plugins can have C++ code in them, or bin pack analyzers, or writers. Uh, one of the things I expect, we haven't talked about this yet, but one of the things that I expect is that we'll take the Bro plugins repository, which exists now and has things like a NetMap plugin, and Miracom plugin, and PFRing plugin, and Redis plugin, and Kafka plugin, and all these things that are using external libraries, and, and they, they really need to be built. Um, I expect we'll break those all out into packages and get rid of the bro plugins repository because then everything can be managed separately and really has no tie to each other and can be installed with bro package. But what you would actually see is some differences in this. And it's all documented, but you would make, you'd add some extra stuff to the bro package.meta file that, um, that would indicate that something needs to be built. And you would... Um, it's a little more complicated because you actually have to have a bro installation where you're running bro, con bro package install because it needs to reference that to see header files and stuff. So there are some complications added to that, and I was avoiding it for simplicity. But that is a possibility. And I'm sure you'll start seeing those packages pretty soon too because it shouldn't take very long to refactor the bro plugins repository into packages. That's right. There are those are there already. That, that's right. Oh, so Robin pointed out another thing I forgot about. Um, you can do Bro Control plugins too. So Bro Control has a separate API, and this matters for things like um, uh, I'll use the uh, the Miracom plugin that I was working on recently as an example. Um, it. So I, I, I suppose many of you have probably configured Bro Control and you kind of know how to do like the LB prox thing and you know get that all configured. But uh, some of the some of like the packet source plugins, where the NetMap one, for instance, uses the sniffer driver API to acquire the packets, and you have to do certain configuration things to get it to do load balancing and how many processes you want to balance out to and um, and uh, all of the stuff, and Bro Control needs to do certain things when it runs Bro to make sure that all set up correctly. And um, we don't really want to include specific support. We would like to have everything abstracted. So like it's all a little bundle. You put it in. Bro doesn't know how to do any of that stuff. You install it, and now it can work, and it's very easy. And uh, the NetMap and Miracom plugins now do that. They actually understand the load balancing stuff. They have bro control plugins with them. And um, yeah, so bro control plugins is another one if you need to extend the functionality of bro control. So three things, <laughs> bro scripts, bro control plugins, and uh, bro plugins, which a bro plugin is a compiled thingy. Um, you can have one or all of those in a package. There, there's no limitations. You can't just put one of them in a package. Okay, so I'm going to pull request, get merged. Okay, so some of the stuff to get, and please feel free to say something if I missed anything here. I meant to show you this prior. But um, the uh, future directions are things like dependencies. Clearly, that's a very user-oriented feature that's quite obvious, but we, you got to start somewhere. And we'd like people to start using it before it's there even, because why not? I, I, there's not going to be a lot of dependencies day one, so, and there aren't. Um, testing and linting infrastructure to make sure, just to do some sort of sanity check to make sure that someone's not committing like a Perl script and being like, "Wee, install that," and you're like, "What? What is this? Doesn't even make any sense." Um, more automation on the back end for managing the package repositories, so you could have um, 
uh, it, basically what you would expect with PIP or GEMS or CPAN, that, where they've automated a lot of the back-end handling of those systems. And then more packages. I mean, certainly turning the Bro plugin stuff, sort of modernizing it and making it into packages and, um, and uh, making it available for installation through Bro package. But... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it on here real quick. Actually, wait. Can I do that? Does that work? Okay, that worked. All right. Um, I have Bro 2.5 installed. This is just on my laptop, just kind of playing around. I have Bro 2.5 installed. Um, so I, I make the decision that I, that I want to run Bro packages. So clearly the first thing I do is pip install bro package, and I uninstalled it so I could do that. <laughs> Wait, hold on. I'm not, I, I'm not, somehow, I thought for sure. No, no, I'm just going to do it through my phone, it's faster. Hold on, just one second. Okay, let's see if it works now. Yay, okay. So bro package 0 0.5 just installed. And that, that's nice, except, uh, you know, I don't even know what happens if I run bro package. Yeah, there we go. Now it's going to start complaining. That's good, it complained. Yay, my user does not have permission to write places. It doesn't have permission to write. Um, so... We can go ahead really quickly and say that. So I'm giving my user access to write to the site directory, which is where scripts go, and to the plugins directory, which is where, I bet you can't guess what goes there. Exactly. OK, so now that that happens, we can, oh, apparently I had one installed already. Anyway, I, did, I forgot to delete the directory, my home directory. Let's delete that. OK. <laughs> yeah, it didn't work. That was what it was supposed to do the first time. But now remember, we had that auto config thing, so let's do make dir. Actually, I bet it downloaded the thing already. But anyway, make dir. Yeah, that's what I thought. All right. So now we have to do the auto config thing. Oh, and this this will fail too, but this is probably instructive because I bet every single one of you that tries to do this will encounter the same thing because I'm about to encounter it right now. Yeah, okay. Bro config is not in the path. That's where, remember, we had to add the path because it needs to know where the bro binary is or where bro is installed generally. Uh, okay, so path equals user local bro bin path. Okay, now we've got that. We'll run auto config. And actually, you know what? I didn't show this, so let's go ahead and look in the config. So what's actually happened when we did that is... And this is, all, again, all described on the website, too, so you can go look at the documentation. But it's nice. That autoconfig thing just it found, we told it where the bro installation was, or where the binary was, and then it just went ahead and found everything. So you can see even bro dist. You can see where I built bro, and that's because it needs header files. And so to find where bro is built from, it's going to do that. But that's only for, for plugins that are compiled. And there's, there's going to be things, I'm sure, that we'll address eventually surrounding that. Yeah. Yes, probably. That was, I, I mentioned earlier that you didn't really need to, but whatever. Anyway, everybody should run 2.5. It's going to be out soon. <laughs> no, you can't do that. You're not allowed to. <laughs> Can we change the license with four clause BSD that has an extra clause that says you're only allowed to run 2.5? Um, OK, so, so we've got a config file. What would we do next? I guess we would do, no, we're not going to do sudo. We do bro package list all because we want to see what packages are available. Um, I'm trying to think of a good one. May, maybe I'll just install the uh, install domain TLD. So, 
Yay. That was the whole thing I was talking about with like reducing the three steps to one step, because one step gets you more users, three steps gets you less users. Um, so domain TLD. I know there's a few people I know of running this, and I think that with it being this easy to install and use, probably a lot more people will use it. Uh, that's the bro package list all. That, that's, yeah, what that actually did, so it cloned that bro packages repository, which is like the, the main thing, you know, where you, should, you can like fork that, add your own package, and then we'll merge it back in. Um, that's, it's cloning that repository locally and then going through the stuff in there and finding what's available. And if you want to see more info, and I didn't put this in the presentation, but you can actually do, uh, I guess I should put the command in. You can actually do that. So you actually see down here the description, bro script library for getting the effective TLD of a domain. Um, and you can see other information. And this is all area that I think is valid for people saying, yeah, I don't really like how that works, because this is really all about user inter interface. I mean, this is all just making it fairly pleasant to find things and install them. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I don't believe so. That, that it, that's certainly been a concern that was addressed in the design. I don't think that the current version has addressed that yet, but it's certainly been part of the design discussions, and that's going to be there. I, I, we certainly are not going to make it so you, you know, it only can talk to the internet and has to be able to do that. The, Yeah, my, I, I expect that there will be a way fairly soon that you'll be able to have your machine totally offline where your laptop can talk to it and you can be like locally do stuff and then say, now put it to mine. Yeah, put your Mac in a box. It, it, it can be, it can be a... Um, there's no requirement that it's there's there's no requirement that it's GitHub. It, it, it's like any other package repository. Um, kind of a mess. Yeah, yeah. I I think I think there will be some mitigations for that, and that's the nice thing about having our own package management system that is not depending on other people. Is that people use Bro differently than most programming languages. And I mean, we certainly recognize that. And um, I, I think you'll see things like that that are oriented around how Bro is used, and, and it's just not in place yet. But you'll, I think you'll see that. You, you could certainly, yeah. It's a little bit more complex, even because um, I mean, this, the central packages repository is, um, I mean, that's essentially just the index of packages, the package content is maintained in individual user repositories. So basically you need to be able to connect to both, to, to, the, to the central one to get the index and, the, and this meta information, and then to the user one to get the actual content. Uh, Yeah, we, we, we thought about maintaining the user content right inside the, the central one, but then basically every time you update your package, you would have to come to us to file a pull request to kind of merge it in. So we actually wanted to do this pull request only like once initially, so get into the package index at all, and then you can maintain your data. Um, but yeah, I think we need to address this issue of, of the offline operation mode. Point to your, what do you mean? Point to your GitHub where? Uh, you you could do that. I mean, you could run your own package repository, but then you, you clearly don't get the benefit of. Uh, you, yeah, you could do that. You could you could 
pretty yeah. easily you have something clone yeah. just everything right. that exists locally. Yeah, yeah. So you would need to w some way to kind of mirror the the content locally. Just to give this back. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. It, but but any comments like that are. are so any, any comments, though, about the, the way you use it or how you want to use it are completely valid because this is all about discovering the way people uh, can use it and can't use it and limitations. That's also why, if you look at it right now, it's super limited because we always get surprised every single time by the way people want to do things or use stuff. And, it, you know, so it takes some time. And so right now it's a very, very limited thing. So we're not like sort of developing down paths that end up being totally wrong and causing problems in the future. So thank you for commenting. It's, it's completely valid to ask stuff like that. Um, so anyway, that stuff is, is pretty much installed. The only, um, the only other thing that I, that I could point out is if I... If I run bro just like that, so it's not really doing anything. There's nothing coming in or anything. Um, it did not load any of the packages that I installed because the package manager is separate from bro and separate from everything. But if I do that, oh, no, OK, it's because it had something to load. So it, um, it actually loaded that domain TLD thing. If I'd had time, I would have pulled together a better example where you could see working and whatever. I could write a script really quick. But um, are there any other questions or thoughts? Yeah. Uh, oh. Um. Yeah, you can add like uh, if so. If I do. Um, so there's that SSN exposure one. I can do oh, bro package install Seth Hall SSN. Whoop. There. So you can actually tell it which one you want to install. Um, there's certainly questions probably there to be answered to and problems to run into that we haven't encountered yet. I mean, keep in mind, you know, right now there are four published packages. <laughs> Three of them were in the last week, um, and one of them was yesterday. Uh, so so there's, there's lots of little things like that, but there are certainly, um, you can even, I think, give it a whole, like, you know, you could do HTTPS colon slash slash github.com slash whatever. You can do that, and it'll install that same way. Um, shoot, there was something I thought of, though, when you were asking that. Um, Um, it, it's created per user. Oh, wait. It's not very big. There. So, um, yeah, the, the index file is created per user. So, like, I'm documenting all of my packages in my user directory with my bro. See, it's got packages slash Seth Hall slash bro package dot index. Correct. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, so there is, there is a distinction. So it's basically, there's lots and lots of Git repositories. And then there is a few of these index repositories. And this one is called bro slash packages. So this is yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, um, and actually, uh, I'm not going to show it. I forget where it is. But I've actually released an update for one of my packages already. So I've got, like, 1.0.1 or something like that. And 
The uh, command line client, I said refresh to refresh the remote repositories, and I did upgrade, and it upgraded the one. Uh, it, just, it, it was great, because normally this stuff is just painful enough that like you never do it. And you'll have people that are running out-of-date versions of things, and I just can't wait to be like, oh, just update your package. I fixed it yesterday, and go ahead. That'll, that'll be a great change. Yeah. OK. Uh, you mean where someone removes a package? Like the Node.js thing where they removed, like, left justify. <laughs> Um, le, uh, okay, so the, qu the question was basically how, how are you ensuring that people aren't putting up malicious things? Let me, that was, that was actually a lot of us fought for that initially. We were like, oh, we have to vet everything, whatever. Let me, let me run down that path of what the world might look like if we had continued with that. You're all in here and you're writing bro packages and it's all great and then it's a two week lead time or three week or two month lead time, you're like, I've done with my package, publish it, and then two months later, it's actually published because there are two or three people that are vetting things to make sure they're not malicious. It's actually not really the scenario you want. I mean, you're already running tons of code. When do you go and vet it, vet everything from pip, I mean, before you install it? Yeah, I mean, how many, how, how many times do people type sudo pip and go, oh. like, I mean, that's what you should do, but no one does because generally things are okay. And so, I, I th yeah. Yeah. It, it's good, it's good. It's good that we were funded at the level we were by Mozilla because it actually gives us a long runway to really build this out as something nice. I, I, I think that that's the main thing. It's like it didn't really cost that much to get to this point, but we've got the, the easy, the easy 90% is done. <laughs> now for the hard 10%. How do you get a um, you emailed them? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, feedback? To, uh, Well, I, well, so one thing you could do if someone hosts their package on GitHub, you can file a ticket on their uh, repository. Yeah, I, 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 I don't see us doing that, at least initially, but, um, you know, GitHub, it's, I, I actually, that seems to be a pretty viable mechanism for providing feedback to, I, I can imagine a ticket going in being like, I think there's a bug in this, or it fails in a certain circumstance, and then, the developer goes, oh, and fixes it, and then you do refresh and update, and you're done. Um, yeah, there was a, a question. Yeah. I was just tuning back. Well, we, we have discussed a lot about at least having some automated linting to look for clearly malicious stuff or clearly bad things or even things that are somewhat suspicious, like someone using the system biff is probably a little suspicious. Um, or at least something that a user might want to be notified about to say, hey, this is doing, you know, calling the system biff and can be running like just any command line. And, um, I mean, there's some amount of sort of automated stuff that we can do, and there's there's uh, one of the packages that I published actually has some tests included with it. Like one of the things I didn't even talk about that we haven't touched on yet in uh, Bro package is the ability to like include Bro tests with your script because one of the things that you can get into now. Let's imagine a scenario where you install script A and you install script B. They both redef the same value. Suddenly, one of them's broken, or both of them are broken, or they both work. Who knows? Maybe they redef it to the same value. But imagine if every script that you installed had tests that is like, yes, I work. 
And then what you could do is, because we can't test every, imagine there's even just 100 packages. Suddenly, to test every single potential combination of those packages, how do you do that? Well, they each have tests to verify they work. And so what we, what we theoretically could do is have a thing where you type bro package test, and it says with the scripts that are currently installed, do all the tests and all those scripts work. And then hopefully you could get some validation. And it actually makes maybe a version upgrades a little easier because a script might break when you upgrade it to 6 or to 7 or whatever, and the tests might help with that. But we, we haven't done enough discussion about it yet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's true. You could, so the suggestion was automating rep, uh, reputation, and you could simply say, "Look, it's been downloaded a million times. That'd be cool. Having a million downloads." <laughs> Well, uh, one way instead of doing whitelisting or blacklisting is that you can make sure that when you install, you just always include the prefix. Like, like. See, that's the thing is I, I think that any time that we start trying to provide too much structure, it always sounds so enticing for us to do that, to provide restrictions and things. But the reality is that I don't think it provides a very nice experience. It, it sort of sounds nice. Yeah. Yeah, I could see that. That'd probably be pretty easy to add to. Yeah, I, I could see adding something like that, and and that would be nice, I guess, because then all of a sudden, um, people that have the ability to run bro package would only be able to install install packages from certain um, yep. file a fi uh, We need to make it so people can file tickets related to bro package manager. <laughs> Well, they can file. Yeah, that's true. We can, they can file in there. But yeah, feel free to. I mean, if if you have use cases, I mean, you know. Fight for, a, fight for your opinion, for sure. Uh, there's, there's certainly a green field in terms of where we go with this, because this is like the same as uh, Ruby Gems 0 0.1 or whatever when it was, I think, when they, I think they created that at a bar, the first version of it, in a couple of hours. And uh, that's basically where we are right now. There's, there's a long road ahead and a lot of changes. So. Um, that's the Bro Package Manager. I hope you guys use it. Please let us know if there's any trouble or things you wish it did. Yeah, if you want to, if you want to work on Bro Package, it's all written in Python, so it's it's maybe a more well-known language. <laughs> so anyway, thank you very much.